I'm going to look at the uh, book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. I'm going to talk about something that I know the best. That's the history of our work. And uh, the reason why I know it, it is because I lived through it. And because I lived through it, and I can always explain it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Two, by whom we also have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice and hope for the glory of God. Three, not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Aha, uh -huh, that's very hard to do. But not, all, not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Uh-oh, that's a bad thing. Also, knowing that tribulation work at patience, patience experience, and experience will work hope. Somehow, God has to use to give us some tribulation in our life so that we can grow in our life in order that we can get closer to him. So whenever you feel like that you are down or you are going through a hard time, just remember God is tuning you to get in closer to him. In Ecclesiastic chapter 3 verse 4 says like this, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. Therefore there time for tribulation, there is time for rejoicing, there is time for victory, there is time for glory, there is time for revival, there is time to, oh well, uh, to sleep down sometime when we feel like a little bit long, a little bit down. But time is what God uses. Is the time is the prerogative of God which he uses so that we can learn and we can trust him. So whatever you feel today, don't worry about it, because God is changing for tomorrow, and tomorrow is going to be a better day, because whatever you feel today, tomorrow you're going to be closer to the Lord. And as time goes by, we will find that we will grow in our spiritual life, and we'll learn how to be able to trust and believe in God. Trust and believe in God, it means an everyday life. We cannot just trust in God on Sunday morning when we go to church and then forget about for the rest of the week. We have to trust God for every, every moment of our life, for whatever we do, whatever, uh, whatever we are going to have, uh, uh, whatever project we are going to make in the future and for our life. We must trust in the Lord. He is the one who will lead us. I am and we are privileged today. Because we are living in days which we have seen the greatest and the most powerful revival since the beginning of the church, in, since the beginning of the church in the Acts of the Apostles. And you say, but how did we see that? It's very simple. It was not too long ago in an unknown street called Azusa in Los Angeles, there was a small group of people who desired to see the power of God. And suddenly the power of God came upon them. They were revived by the Spirit of God and they were so enthused that they began to enthuse other people and revival began to spread and the moving of the Spirit of the Lord since that time began to flow upon the face of the earth and is still flowing today. It was in 1918 when a group of a handful of men, about 16 of them, they got together in, a, in one of the uh, uh, United States country. Uh, uh, United States somewhere and they got together and they bounded together and they decided that they were going to work for God. They dedicated their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and they began a new day in their life and they did a new day in their life and from that time on the greatest movement of Pentecostal movement was, was, uh, uh, was started in the face of the earth and the assemblies of God were began 
beginning, in a humble beginning, in a small little place where, where 18 men decided that they were going to conquer the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be done. It will be done. It's impossible to have it done because it has happened in my day. Today, those 18 or 16, I don't remember exactly how many of them, they have grown and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied all around the world. That just in the United States, unfortunately, the Assemblies of God has become one of the biggest Pentecostal work in which is, is existing today. Through them and by them and by way of them, others have splintered and created more work and large work and many works and many people have come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has happened and it has not happened 2,000 years ago. It has happened today right while I am speaking to you. It has happened and is still happening. And around the world, revival began. In 1950, I was in England and I was invited together with the, uh, uh, school, uh, with the school to go to the first Pentecostal conference that was ever held in the, uh, in the world. The first Pentecostal World Conference was held in London. And I went there because I was invited with others, and the Italian delegation was there as well. And I can always remember there was a man, but called his name, doesn't mean much to you today, but his name was Lewis. He was there representing the country of Norway. And as he stood on the platform, many other people stood with him to give him an ascending ovation. He was the biggest uh, he had the biggest church in Europe. That is 1950, my friend. He had the biggest church in Europe, in which was in Stockholm, Norway, and it was the biggest church that you ever uh, that you ever planted. And there it was. It was today. God is working. Is moving. It is not long time ago. You were born at that time. You were still. You were all alive at that particular time. And that was the church in which God had planted. It was the, uh, the revival that was spreading in other countries as well. World War II was finished. The people were hungry. The hunger for people to say, for God. They wanted peace. They have gone to the war. Now they wanted peace. And revival began to spread from one country to another, to one country to another, until it reached also our country. Our country was also blessed by the beginning of revival, by the power of God at the end of World War II. When the, when the, uh, when, when the gospel was preached by the handful of people who went through the hardship of persecution, when the hardest, uh, the, the hardship of uh, the uh, uh, the biggest problem that uh, uh, our family ever had, it was the persecution of the fascist regime. They have decided to take the Pentecostal away from the kingdom of Italy. They wanted to obliterate it. They wanted to put them to jail. They wanted to get out of them. There was my family, my father, my grandfather, and many of the other people, a handful of them. They went underground. They began to worship somewhere in, somewhere in the caves, going for prayer for the Holy Spirit in caves underground. Pray, praying under the tree, in the bushes somewhere, to have a, to, to have a meeting. There was any place, that any place would be good, as long as would be far away from from the city and away from the uh, uh, from the from the police from the police but god was blessing them the power of god was with them god was sustaining them to the hardship of persecution he was sustaining them so that when they came out even through tribulation, they went through the hardship of tribulation and they were strengthened by the power and the presence of God and the Spirit of God that when, that when freedom came to the country, they began to blast all over the place and the people began to receive the gospel and churches were brought up from one place to another place to another place and another place. It is the power of God that makes the church and not the power of man. 
I found that many of the people that were used by God in the old days, they were simple people. They were not people of high educational standard. Most of them, there were people that hardly could sign their own name. People that just, just loved the Lord. The first person that ever came to our country in Italy is a name, a man by the name of James, a migrant in the United States, in the city of Chicago. And one day uh, he was a shoemaker. Shoes in the little shop, in the little corner. The Lord came to him and he said, James, I want you to go to Europe. I want you to go to your own country. And I want you to bring the gospel for the country is in darkness. And he said, Lord, how can I go? I, first of all, I don't, I'm nobody. I don't have the money. And I don't have the means even mentally to be able to, to do such a thing. And the Lord said, but I want you to go. I have chosen you. So after a while, he decided to accept the invitation that God had given him. He had no money. He had no way of supporting himself. And so he, the Lord said, I want you to go down to the pier and wait for the ticket to come. So he went to the pier, he got in line. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, it's happened to me once. Tell you what, the nerves are really, really going. No matter how spiritual you are, the nerves really get on you. <laughs> there he was waiting for getting the ticket on a boat in order to go to Italy, in his own country. And he was waiting and nothing happened. Keep waiting and nothing happened. And he kept going closer and closer to the teller where he had to buy the ticket and he still didn't have the money. Sometimes the Lord pushes you right to the edge of things. I wish he would do things my way sometime. Ah, I will make him prepare things so years ahead so that I don't have to worry. But he doesn't do that. You see, he waits until the last minute. And so he was there, two people in front of him. He put his hands in his pocket. He had no money. He said, what am I going to tell the teller now? I need a ticket. And he said, I don't have the money. So the last, another man, another person went by, and he was the second in line. When a gentleman came by, he get, put an envelope in his hand, and he said, are you James? He said, yes, the Lord told me to give you this. And he left. Not even time to say thank you. Nothing. He just left and disappeared. He opened up the, <coughs> he opened up the envelope. There was enough money for the ticket and some spare too. Because when God blesses you, he blesses you in fill, a full cup and overflowing. So he had enough money to be able to go to go to Europe. So he said, thank God. He went closer to the ticket, uh, to, the, to the teller. He got the ticket and he got on a boat and he went to Europe. Now, he didn't have any place to go. And he said, where am I going? I don't even have relatives here. They're all dead. Where am I going? Who am I going to see? So right there in the boat, he had to get out of the boat and go somewhere. And so the Lord said, well, go down to the park and sit down. That's a good thing. I wish the Lord would tell me that more often. <laughs> go to the park and sit down and just watch the birds go by. And so he went and he sat down over there. And while he was sitting for about 20 minutes or so, somebody came and he said, are you James? Yes, I want you to come to my home tonight. I want you to be a guest in my place. And so he went. And that was the first the beginning of his work. Then he began, he began to talk about the Lord, and a church was born, a group of people were born in that home. After that, he went to another town, and the Lord said, go to that particular town. He went over there, it was August, very hot in Europe in August, and it's time for harvest. And he didn't know where to go and who to go, because he didn't know anybody. That's the usual thing. And so he went to the field, and there were people there that they were harvesting the, uh, the grain, and they were harvesting by hand in those days, you know. And, and he uh, said, so he took his jacket off, and he went there, and he began to harvest with everybody 
nobody else. They never said a word to anybody. When it 12 o'clock, uh, 1 o'clock came, it's time to eat. And in Italy, at 1 o'clock, you eat regardless of what. That's time to eat. And so they all sat under the tree. The lady came down with a big thing of food. And they all sat down and f uh, sat down. And the owner of the place, he said, uh, Sir, he said, who, who, who are you? And he said, oh, my name is James. He said, uh, well, thank you for helping us. I mean, we, you know, we need all kind of help. But how come you come to help us? Oh, he said, I'm glad you asked me. Jesus sent me. <laughs> Jesus sent me. And he told me to come and help you because he knew that you needed help. And then he began to tell him about the, the grace of God and the power of God and the glory of God and so on and so on. That by the time the night was over, that family gave their heart to the Lord. Lord, and then a couple of more family gave their heart to the Lord and he left there and he went to another place. Where did you go? Well, it, another place. The Lord leads you and makes you go. Now here is a man, I'm telling you, here is a man who could hardly write his name under, uh, sign his name anywhere. He never went to school. He never done anything. But he knew how to get in touch with God. My friend, it is time if we want to see a revival that we learn how to get in touch with God. We must learn how to get in touch with God. I know that we are going to the prayer meeting every Tuesday night, and we are going to pray, and it's a great time in which we have. Lately, it seems that we are getting a little bit tired, and, and we pray, we stay there, but we sit down, and it seems that uh, there is no longer that zeal that, uh, that, that, that was in the beginning. My friend, it is time that we revive ourselves, and we let the Spirit of God come upon our life, so that we can really do something for God. We will never do anything for God as long as we sit back and we do nothing. We must let the Holy Spirit lead us for the glory of God and for the power of God. In 1920, in 1928, uh, uh, in 1928, finally the uh, small groups, about uh, uh, about uh, 10 or 20 groups that this man have left uh, all, all over the country, they began to come together and they formed the first Pentecostal church in now that church started in the beginning and then the uh, when the fascist regime uh, realized that uh, uh, there was a group called Pentecostals which were not the traditional church and therefore they were not exactly what they would have liked to have they um, uh, they uh, they got together and they uh, uh, came out with a law which was strictly against the Pentecostal people Persecution started and so on and so on, but those things did not stop the people from what they had to do for the kingdom of God. Look, what you go through is not important. What you go through is just a time in which it's uh, God is training us in order that we can close a little, we can a little bit closer before the presence of God. In 1940 was the end of World War II, there was a new freedom, different kind of persecution, but the persecution was still there, not uh, at the point where you go to jail, but it was there. Let me tell you something. I believe in God's timing. I remember the time I was, oh, anyway, somewhere around there. It makes no difference, really, is it? Uh, anyway, somewhere around there. I remember the time where the police have raided all the places where our brothers and sisters were, and they took everybody to jail. Now, my mother was there, too. My uncle almost died in jail, but uh, I'm not talking about them now. I'm talking about what happened at this particular time. The court have uh, condemned some of our brothers. They had condemned to jail for life. <clears throat> There was no way that they could come out. The condemnation was already there. They had to start to service the, the condemnation of the court, and therefore the people didn't know what to do. But a handful of people got together. They began to pray. Do I believe in prayer? Yes, I believe in prayer. And that dear here, they began to pray. The first night, nothing happened. The second night, nothing happened. But it was about the third night, I think, or the fourth night, when this group, people, they were praying. And I remember I was there. 
I was allowed to go to sleep, to go to bed only after certain things have happened. So I had to stay there with them. But they prayed all night for three consecutive nights. The fourth night, there was a noise outside of the house. My father opened up the window to find out what was happening. And somebody from outside, he yelled. He said, um, uh, he said the fascist regime has been uh, thrown out of the country. The king has put a new leader, and therefore Mussolini is no longer in power anymore. anymore. And all of the political uh, people that were uh, prisoners are free. Now, <clears throat> somebody said, oh, well, there was always been an anti fascist group of people that were trying to get him out of the, the way. And so it just, um, you know, it just happened that way. But let me ask you, why the fortnight, at, uh, at 11.45 a night, the fortnight, while, while a group of people were praying for four nights, why at that particular time? Could have happened any time, but it happened at that time. Why? Because I believe in answering a prayer. God will always answer prayer. And therefore, you, if, he, if he waits, if he delay a little bit, all we have to do is just to wait for a little bit. For he certainly is going to do the work in which he has promised us to, be, to, uh, promise us to do. That time, at that hour, our brothers and sisters were freed from prison because God answered prayer. There is no power in the world that can get or match the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no power that can match the power of the church when the church comes together and looking for God. I am looking to the future. I'm looking for the future for very excitement. For I believe that what I have seen happen before, a group of people become thousands of churches together, a group of people who didn't even know how to read and write, yet they have over 600 radio stations, a group of people that didn't know how to provide for anybody else, they have orphanage, old people's home, and children camps, and all of those things, and television stations, and they have become now what we call the second largest organization. Uh, uh, religious organization in the country of Italy. And therefore, God can do it. It is possible that God can do it. It was not too long ago, and that is it in my days, when God began to move in Asia. And a man by called by... Uh, uh, forgot his name. But anyway, you know him. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, began, he was called to God to begin a work in, uh, uh, there in Asia... In, uh, in Asia, and as he began to work, the work began to grow and grow and grow. And he's got the largest church in the world today. Yonggi Cho is the name. And he's got the largest church in the world today. Here is a man. i seen him. i met with him. You can hardly hear when he speaks, and you can hardly know. His accent is worse than mine, and you can hardly understand sometimes what he's saying. But there he is, because the power of God comes upon him. He doesn't care what kind of language you talk in the Holy Spirit doesn't care if you speak the King's English or you speak the language that is spoken down to the street when the Holy Spirit come he will make people understand what you're saying and they know what you're saying because they feel it within their soul and their heart there it is the largest church church in the world. I've been told that you go to Singapore, that is one, some of the largest churches today, churches which are large, a thousand 2,000 people in, the, in, in, in Singapore itself and all over throughout Asia. My friend, it's time for Australia to get the visitation of God. And the reason why I am excited is because I believe that now is the time for this country, what we call the country of the Holy Spirit. It is the time that the Holy Spirit start moving. And I know, who knows, maybe God has chosen this group of people in order to make that power Powerful move of the Holy Spirit come upon the country of Australia. Maybe God wants to use you and you and you. Maybe God wants to use you. Maybe God wants to use you or me, whoever. 
too old to do anything now. But I'm looking for the newer generation which they are coming in with the excitement of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm looking for the new musicians who are coming to preach and to take that and to, and to sing songs which will be so filled with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm looking for the day when the people will come in from that room. They will come with problems and they will go home freed of all the problems that they have. I'm looking for the day when the people will come sick and with a wheelchair from that particular door. And when they come, they will leave the wheelchair and go back home. I have seen it happen before and it can happen again and again and again until Jesus come and it will happen because that is our heritage that is the heritage of the Pentecostal work that is the heritage of the people who are bounding themselves together and they believe together and they know each other and they seek God and God will move in their heart and in their life and through their life and heart it is not how much school you have. It is not, I'm not against school, by the way. I mean, I've done four years of uni myself. I know what it, it is. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking it when God wants to move you. He moves you. No matter how you are. No matter what you are. And I'm waiting for a great day. For the great day of the Holy Spirit to move. You know, you can come here with problems and you go home without. You can come here sick, and you can go home without sickness anymore. I'm expecting one of these days that my wife will walk. You know how she walks? <laughs> but I'm waiting for that day that after she comes, and the power of God will move upon the church, Spirit of the Lord is moving upon the church that she will be like she was the way I know her, running up and down the praise and praising and glorifying God. It can happen? Yes, it can. How do you know it can happen? Because it happened before. How do I know it happened? Because it happened to us. Because it happened in my days. I'm not talking about the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. I'm not talking about the, 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 the early church days of, a, of the Acts of the Apostles because I don't believe that in God there is an early church of the Acts of the Apostles. I believe that the Acts of the Apostles have started in the early church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, but it went on to Judea and to Samaria and to the other parts of the world. And today is coming to Australia for the glory of God, the power of God. We believe, we believe, and I believe because it happened. What is unbelievable will be believable by the, by the moving and the power of the Spirit of God. <laughs> I get another couple of pages, but I don't think I'll let you can take it. Uh, well, I can't take it. Uh, we leave it there for some, some other time. But I want you to know that it was at the end of World War II when the work in Italy was growing so fast. And I remember the leaders in the office in Rome they would come together and say, we got so many calls, who are we gonna send there? Who is, can go there and take care of these people? One pastor used to have three, four churches, five churches. It had to be one, you know, you visit over here, you hurry up. I've been down there in some, some of the places where in the morning at eight o'clock you preach in one place, at 10 o'clock you preach in another place, then back into your motorcycle, by two o'clock you're preaching somewhere else, and then back in the motorcycle you go somewhere else, and by four o'clock you're preaching somewhere else, and then back on the motorcycle and you go somewhere else, and by eight o'clock at night you're preaching somewhere else. Now I'm telling you, that is hard work. But in those days I could take it. I was as young as you. <laughs> See, I could take it. Now, <clears throat> well, I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't go by motorcycle. 
the reason is the doctors told me that the cold air against the sweat after you finish preaching is not good for you. It gives you pneumonia. So I have to listen to him because I'm old enough, you know. Now I can listen. So I wouldn't go by motorcycle anymore. Now I need a car. Yes, yes. I need a car where I can... And I also need a driver so I can relax <laughs> while I'm going up to those places. Those were the days. Believe me, those were the days. And those were the days when the Lord came to me and he called me to the ministry. How did he call me? Not because somebody excited me. He called me because he came, visited me, called me by name. And he said, I want to talk to you. That was how I was 15, 16. The Lord said to me, I want you to go into the ministry. I want you to serve me. And I said, nah. <laughs> he said, Lord, when I go to young people meeting, I always sit behind somebody at the end so that the pastor doesn't see me, otherwise he might call me to pray or testify, and you know that I'm not, not very good at that, so um, that's why I hide, actually, I hide. And uh, the Lord said, yeah, but <clears throat> I want you to go. And I said, Lord, I, I'm getting involved in a job now with some kind of work, which once this is over, <coughs> I will be able to support at least four or five or six or more workers in the field. He said, Lord, that would be much more advantageous for the work. And the Lord said, <clears throat> he said, nah, I don't want your money. I want you. <laughs> and you, you got a problem there, man. You, 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 you run out of all the excuses you can make. So I went home and I told my uncle, I said, the Lord called me into the ministry. And my uncle said, you must be nuts. <laughs> I said, why? He said, you want to be one of those pastors that go always penniless with no money, going around begging for money all the time and starving your family and your kids. He said, you must be crazy. You stay here with me. We can provide for everything that you want. So I wait the next time the Lord comes by, I said, Lord, uh, it's true what you say, and I don't mind doing it, but my uncle said, <laughs> my uncle said that I will be poor, that I will be no money, that I wouldn't be able to provide for my kids, and I would grow up and be a poor person. And I said, Lord, <clears throat> I can't do that to the family. Uh, I said, I just can't do it. Can we do, make some kind of another deal? Do you know that the Lord is patient? And do you know that the Lord, if, you, if he starts talking to you, he will talk to you until he solves the situation? <laughs> and he said to me that particular morning, he said, he said to me, he said, I am calling you. You be working for me, and I will provide for everything you need. And you have to worry for nothing. How old am I? I'm 82 years old. I went around the world eight, nine times. I don't know. I, I ministered in so many countries that I don't even remember them anymore. But I have spiritual sons that they speak all kinds of languages that if they talk to me, I don't even know what they're talking about. But they are there. They are saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've been around in so many places and so, and, and, and so on. And the Lord always provides. I have never asked for a penny to one person. How do you do it? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. But the first time that I had uh, was in the, in the hardship, it was when I decided that before I went to the ministry, I would go to Bible college for a couple of years and then start into the ministry. That was the way that everybody was doing it. So I had to do the way everybody else was doing it. In those days, the church was supposed to pay for the trip. There were four of us for 
trip of four of us to go to England for the Bible College, pay for the trip. The night, two nights before, the, uh, two nights before, I get a call from the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, and he said, Joseph, what? He said, um, the church has decided he's not going to pay for anybody. Ah, I said, it's okay. <coughs> what do you mean it's okay? It's okay. I wasn't expecting anything from anybody anyway. So it's okay. So he said, do you have the money? I said, no, nah, but I'll have it by then. <laughs> he looked at me a little bit, you know. He was the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, but he's like my father. That's why I could talk to him like that. And, and, and he, he, he looked at me like, say, it's just like you, you know? Oh, wait, you never think serious about anything. But I was serious. I, I didn't have the money. What do you want me to do? Go and get a night job so I can get the money? I mean, I wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be the Lord's will for me to do that. And so I didn't do it. The morning came, 10 o'clock, the train was leaving the station. Would you be surprised that this is why I, I, I don't like it, that this is what happened? Would you be surprised if I tell you that it was 9.30 before I had the money in my pocket to buy the ticket? Now, I, it's a 10 to 10, we were leaving. At 9.30, I get the money. Up to then, I didn't have a penny. This is why I wish the Lord would listen to me sometime, and he does things a different way. Would have been much better if he would have provided the money a week before. I had nothing to worry, nothing to problem, no problem. I didn't have to run anywhere. I had the money in my pocket. And when everybody was asking me, you got the money? I said, yep, I got it in my pocket. That's it. No worry, no problem. But it didn't happen that way. And I found that in my years that it doesn't happen that way when you are with God. He does it his own way doesn't listen to me. <laughs> From that time on, I learned my lesson. And whatever the Lord wants me to do something, he'll provide the money first. And we had a saying with my wife, you know, we, we went around quite different places. We went to, um, we went to Ukraine and we went to um, at one time, we went to Spain. And of course, we never ask money for anybody. So our saying is this. Are we willing to go? Yes. As soon as the Lord provides the ticket for us to go. But if you don't ask, I've been told while I was in, college, in America that the Lord provides, but you have to ask. And I said, no, I don't have to ask because I'm doing God's work, and therefore, he is my boss. If he's my boss, he has to provide for me. And that's all there is to it. It's simple, simple that way. My friend, forget about myself. I'm here, getting older, but I am only waiting before my days will be over to see the power of God moving, at least for the end of time, upon this land, which is called the land of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord called me here, I came here, not because I wanted to or because I felt was better than anywhere else. The Lord told me to come here, and so I came here. He never told me to leave, so something is going to happen. <laughs> something is going to happen, and it's got to happen for God. Hallelujah! It's going to happen for God. It's God is going to use these people, these people, so that His glory will be manifested in this country. Let us all stand, shall we?